My name is Mark Donfried, the director and founder of the Institute for Culture Diplomacy. And I must say for me personally, uh, but also for us as an institute professionally, now is actually the ideal time uh, to be discussing exactly the topics that we are going to be focusing on this week. Uh, unfortunately, as one looks at the international uh, situation currently, politically, economically, culturally, uh, we're confronted with many challenges. Uh, it's a time of fragmentation in some parts of the world, a time of transition in other parts of the world, a time of extremism in many parts of the world. Uh, and for many reasons, I think uh, many uh, are getting pessimistic in the sense, what can one do to try to counter sometimes uh, these rapidly destructive factors? And I think cultural diplomacy certainly is not of less importance today. Uh, and I'd be so bold as to say, I think it's of greater importance today. Uh, the one ingredient that I think is necessary for international cooperation to work is the ingredient of trust. And I think trust, as important as it is, is perhaps the most rare uh, of the phenomena that we can find today. You know, what two countries in the world, what two cultures in the world, what two religions in the world sincerely understand each other, sincerely trust each other, not just at the top level in terms of two leaders or, or personalities, but really at a fundamental level between the communities and civil society. Uh, so at the Institute, we would say very briefly, cultural diplomacy ideally should help to educate to enhance and to sustain relationships with this goal of building dialogue, understanding, and trust. And that's why I think it's very, very important that we are all gathered here today uh, and this week to discuss what opportunities are there for greater cooperation within the Arab world, where unfortunately we don't see as much teamwork as we would hope for uh, when grappling with many of the challenges mentioned before. How can we enhance that with cultural diplomacy? How can we also build more understanding and more trust between the Arab world and the rest of the world? I think there again, especially in Germany, uh, where the demographics are changing very rapidly uh, in terms of migration and many other phenomena, very, very important that we have such a dialogue within Germany uh, and, of course, between Germany and its partners in the Arab world. So the importance, I think, is, is really paramount uh, for this conference, and I really am grateful uh, to so many of you who have traveled tremendous distances to be here with us to share your insights. Uh, the goal of the conference, for conference is not to provide a recipe, uh, this is exactly what should be done in this country or that country, but really to share perspectives, to inspire each other, to provoke each other, and hopefully by the end of the conference, we will each think a little differently about one aspect of cultural diplomacy or the other, and ideally, we can actually achieve some results uh, through cooperation and through partnership. I hope that friendships may be built, cooperations may be built, that can really allow us to work together uh, in each of your home countries and beyond after this conference. So I'm very much looking forward to this chance really to learn uh, and also to engage with all of you. Uh, here the participants have just as an important a role uh, as the speakers. Uh, and in that sense, really the idea I would encourage you all, be active, ask questions, debate, conduct interviews afterwards, to have discussions in the coffee breaks. Uh, don't let these speakers go without trying your hardest to ask the questions that you have. It will be challenging. Sometimes we'll have limits of uh, time. There may be many questions at the same time, but I'd really ask you all to do everything you can to be proactive and to contribute to this conference through your perspectives and through also your contributions. I'm very happy, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to begin this conference uh, with a welcome address from a man who in many ways is not only responsible for the development of the Academy for Cultural Diplomacy, but in many ways the field of cultural diplomacy in the academic sense. It's thanks to his hard efforts uh, serving as president of our academy that there actually exist now BA, MA, MBA, and PhD programs in the field of cultural diplomacy. It all began in Romania, as you know, President Constantinescu, in Cluj, University of Babish Bolia, and thereafter in Bucharest, the University of Bucharest, and now over eight universities around the world proudly have partnerships with the Academy to offer over 30 academic programs in the field of cultural diplomacy. So we're really grateful, President Constantinescu, for the contributions that you have given uh, through the, the leadership here at the Academy. For those of you who don't know the very impressive CV uh, of President Constantinescu, allow me to share with you just a few words. The CV is far too long to go into detail, as many of the CVs, so it'll just be brief introductions. President Constantinescu was born in 1939 and is a Romanian professor and a politician who served as the third president of Romania from 1996 until 2000. President Constantinescu first graduated from the Faculty of Law and then the Faculty of Geology and Geophysics at the University of Bucharest, subsequently started a career as a geologist. Beginning in 1966, President Constantinescu taught geology at the Faculty of Geology at the University of Bucharest. After the Romanian Revolution in 1989, Constantinescu became a founding member and vice president of the Civic Alliance. He was the acting chairman of the Romanian Anti-Totalitarian Forum and the first associative structure of the opposition in Romania, which was then transformed into a political and electoral alliance, the Romanian Democratic Convention. 
1992, Konstantinescu was elected president, rector, of the University of Bucharest and became the CDR's candidate for president of Romania. In 1996, he was elected the third president of Romania, which he served from 1996 until 2000. Today, as mentioned, he remains very heavily involved in politics through working for many NGOs, both in Romania and internationally. As mentioned, President Constantinescu is the president of the ICD Academy for Culture Diplomacy and has made really very, very significant contributions to the field of culture diplomacy in terms of research, teaching, and beyond. And in addition, he's the president of the Romanian Foundation for Democracy uh, and is involved in many other NGOs, too far to mention currently. President Constantinescu, I'm so grateful for all of the contributions you have given, and I would be uh, even more grateful if you could please join me on this, uh, the stage to provide some words of welcome as we begin the International Symposium on Culture Diplomacy in the Arab world. If you could please join me in a very warm and a heartfelt applause for the president of the ICD Academy, President Emil Constantinescu. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Salam Aleikum. Uh, your uh, Excellencies, uh, ministers, ambassadors, uh, parliamentarians, uh, religious leaders, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. I am glad to present uh, today uh, my welcome address for International uh, uh, Symposium on um, Cultural Diplomacy in the Arab uh, World, um, focused uh, on uh, the political, economic, and cultural uh, dimensions. Uh, my uh, intervention in focused on uh, cultural dimension and is entitled The Medieval Arab Culture in the European Cultural Heritage, Foundation of the Arab-European Cultural Diplomacy in the 21st Century. Dear friends, um, on Thursday, the 14th of June, 1325, after Christ, the second day of Rajab, 725 after Hejira. The 21st year old Abu Abdullah Muhabad in Batuta had left Tangier. 30 years later, after traveling more 75,000 miles, he returned to Fez, Morocco and wrote a book, The Famous Travels of Im Batuta. His stories reveal us the important role played by merchants traveling the land and seas. His memoirs are a significant historical source for the early Renaissance history of my country, Romania, where the Silk Road linking Spain and China crossed the Amber Road descending from Scandinavia to Greece. In uh, Imbatuta's time, voyages, commerce, education, and faith existed together in a space of dialogue and convergent civilizations. To the world of today, the man of medieval ages seems remote and unfamiliar. Their names and deeds are recorded in our history books. Their monuments adorn our cities. But our kinship with them is often perceived as a romantic image heritage coming out of the Arabian nights. Yet, I believe we can learn a great deal from our Breton of yore, since that was the time of the first global economy and of the first global trade. The European cultural heritage has always been a difficult and extremely sensitive topic for all those interested in preserving and rendering history valuable. The studies written on this matter reached an impressive number, yet no one ever provided a viable solution. The main difficulty consists of the subjective character 
of the very idea of heritage. Almost involuntarily, a Western scholar will favor historic and cultural realities as he perceives them as being more appealing. Minville, an Easterner historian, will always relate to the tradition of his ancestors and will tend to hold second in value the values of those which do not share in that specific tradition. In such cases, it seems that the idea of cultural heritage is reduced to distinguish between concept and settling boundaries on more or less arbitrary basis rather than the concrete and honest identification of the perennial cultural values that decisively laid their mark of your own European culture. It should be noted that all disputes of such sort are almost exclusively fueled by the religious and denominational affiliation of those involved in them. Given the circumstances, the only way to actually solve such dissensions is dialogue, a dialogue structured according to various aspects of reality, scientific, psychologic, cultural, artistic, and last but not least, religious. Naturally, this should be a dialogue based on unity and diversity. And why, and why not on that certain coincidencia oppositorum of which spoke Nicholas of Cusa? Maybe it's not entirely accidental that it was Nicholas of Cusa who wrote shortly after Constantinople fell a short work entitled De Pace Fidei on peace between religions a work which, despite its importance and vision, was overlooked for a long time, for centuries. The conference, organized by the Muslim World League in July 28 in Madrid, under the patronage of King of Saudi Arab, H, uh, H. Abdullah Ibn Abdul Aziz Al Saud, and King of Spain, H. Uh, H. Juan Carlos, may be considered a model in the attempt to set the, the foundation of an effective and durable dialogue between the Christian and Islamic religions. Top level religious leaders and representatives of the theological academia participate in this uh, uh, conference uh, eight years ago. Due to the success of the people and religious species the name of the God assembly, I organized in Bucharest in 1998, and which is probably the event uh, with the widest participation of religious leaders in the world until now. I was invited together with Tony Blair as uh, the only personalities with a statement career. Tony Blair they dedicated himself during the, that period to a peace project in the Middle East, presented only a short speech as a reception offered by the two kings as the Palacio Real, so that I had the honor of holding the keynote opening speech as uh, well as the conference closing speech. I am glad uh, uh, that the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy in Berlin offers me today the possibility of resuming as president of the Academy for Cultural Diplomacy some of the ideas presented in Madrid, enriched by further experience in the context where the appeal to the cultural diplomacy in relation between the Arab and European world becomes imperative. At the base of this uh, undertaking stands a clear conscience concerning the importance of religious life for the contemporary society, as well as the desire to value not only common points, but even more cultural, social, and religious differences in order to ensure a better understanding of the reality we live in. Not in the least, there must be underlined the importance of interreligious dialogue in the context of exacerbating fundamentalism in both Muslim and Christian worlds. The encounter between Christianity and Islam is not by any means recent, <clears throat> on the contrary. One could say 
that the birth of European civilization coincides with the beginning of the dialogue between Islam and Christianity, a dialogue rich in nuances and consequences that have changed in a radical manner the perception of society, as well as that of political organization and that of religious life. <clears throat> it might sound somewhat shocking, yet the very cultural heritage on which we desire to dwell upon will be used as a proof in constructing our thesis. Looking back towards the Middle Ages, we would be tempted to believe that between the Islamic community and Byzantine or Latin Christendom, there has been a permanent struggle, the best example in the, this regard being the Crusades. Each of these communities was convinced of its spirituality and of having the clear conscience of holding the truth. Each of them took pride in their synthesis between religion, culture, society, and political order as being the best framework for human life. The three communities were different in their linguistic, ethnic, military, or commercial models. Yet, one could observe that many similarities arise when focusing on the problem of knowledge. Unlike us, medieval men, whether he was Muslim or Christian, saw in philosophy and theology an indissoluble unity, governing thought and life. Philosophical method and theological thought did more than simply describe abstractions meant to ancient and enlightened minds of the medieval universities, but realities accessible to everyone in accordance with the wine's understanding powers. This meant that despite numerous conflicts between Christendom and Islam, the road of ideas has never been jeopardized. Western Christendom brought with it uh, the ambition for power and uh, the thirst for knowledge and affirmation both rooted in the Greek-Roman tradition. On the other side, Islam leveled the balance by means of the well-built cultural, social, and political system eminently founded on religious principles. This represents the key in understanding the extraordinary spreading of Islam, the belief that Allah, the Almighty, governs everything and everybody and that his work and commandments were made known to humans through Muhammad, his prophet. We find ourselves in the presence of two statements, of two assurances, and of two levels of reality, the absolute and the relative, cause and effect, God and the world. Islam is a religion of certainty and of equilibrium, while Christianity is that of love and sacrifice. It is not uh, to be understood that each of the two religions holds a monopoly. Instead, it would be more appropriate to maintain that each emphasizes one aspect of truth. It is hard to see that certain equilibrium which we are spreading about, speaking about, when looking at the present development of the relationship between the two great monotheistic religions across Europe. The only certainly reaching us seems to be conflict, struggle on various realms, mutual intolerance, and the lack of any desire for dialogue. Yet, we must not forget that all these, these are nothing but the effects of a half understood history, a history out of which each side chose to retain only the dark side. It is almost on a daily basis that the media transmit alarming news related to the migration of Muslims into the boundaries of the European Union, insisting on their so-called incapacity to adapt to the norms and the realities of Western world. Given the situation, we are bound to ask ourselves a very simple 
yet pertinent questions. Do we really know our own values and norms? Or is that everything reduces to a shallow understanding of things, to more convenient, the more dangerous? I shall revert to the image of the Middle Ages, a time beyond the grim characterization it has been subjected to market by an extraordinary culture effervescence and by an enormous knowledge desire which nurtured current civilization. It was in this context that Europe would learn from Islam that the world is a whole comprising both the religious and philosophical realm as well as the secular and that it should be treated as such. Dear friends, to avoid abusing your time and to allow the distinguished guests to present their opinions, I will go over the fascinating history of Latin translation of the dissemination of the treatise published in Cordoba by Abul al-Azur in 1078 in the European cultural space, titled Mujabarat in Latin Experimenta, and also the great work of the Arab philosopher Avicenna in the 12th century. You will be able to find these details in the printed text that they will broadcast it on demand and in a video for the students of the Academy for Cultural Diplomacy. It's, uh, it is a duty of today's intellectual elites to reaffirm in public that as the foundation of the modern Europe lays an Arab heritage often denied and seldom put to good use. He have got used to cliché such an Islamic expansionism, religious fundamentalism, intolerance, yet we remain content with exploring the mere surface of the problem and we do not dare to access its profound dimension. The massive migration of Muslims in the European space is not caused simply by economic or political factors. In a certain manner, they perceive themselves as being tied to the civilization they adopt. And this is due to a shared cultural heritage. And this is not the case of mere philosophical or psychological assumptions, but this is a concrete and well-funding realities. Dear friends, a Muslim can equally be a dependable European citizen and still be a faithful believer without the need of any compromises. The difficulty arises when this European cultural heritage is misinterpreted. Much too often, we confuse the cultures themselves with the heritage the sculpture produced in time. We are permitted to speak about a Greek, Latin, Iberian, or a German culture, but the concept of cultural heritage transcends the nationalist sphere. Its validity extends to the whole European space, and this fact can be observed primarily for the people's way of being from their day-to-day -day existence. As such, as a possibility of authentic interreligious dialogue is conditioned by the understanding and mutual acceptance of this heritage. We are not allowed to forget that the very notion of religion implies the existence of a real communion beyond our differences. Similarly, culture implies before anything else the existence of the dialogue out of which we all have something to learn. Ultimately, the common denominator is a human being with all its aspects. And from this perspective, in the era of globalizations, Muslims and Christians can work together in peace towards understanding the greatest mystery of the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you.